and be able to explain a little bit about our work during the Trump campaign and really how kind of data science and data analytics uh, fed into the digital marketing that we did as part of the campaign. Um, so, next slide. Um, so, one really important thing to start with is that absolutely every single campaign is different. Every single campaign has to be built around the specific um, candidate. It's not really a kind of easy thing to take methodologies and kind of the process from one campaign to another. You know, four years is a really long time. So from 2012 to 2016, the whole marketing ecosystem had really changed. Um, and, and this is kind of something that is really important to remember. The other point that I want to stress before we get into any of the kind of technical detail is that uh, campaigns are really won by the candidate. And candidates who have strong messages, who resonate, and they resonate with kind of the population and the electorate. Next slide, please. All right. So, ooh, yeah. So one thing that is probably interesting to all of you guys is this thought that really campaigns are just like startups. And actually, in some ways, they're the ultimate startup. Um, they kind of ramp up in, from one to 100 in a really short period of time. You can see here kind of the donations. Um, they go from nothing to really ramping up I mean, especially kind of from month 16 to month 21 of a campaign. Um, and this, what does this mean? It means that there are loads of people with loads of different uh, specialities, loads of different experiences. Some people who have just been doing kind of campaigns all their lives. Um, and other people who, you know, it's the first time that they do campaigns. It was really the first time that I worked on a US presidential election. I mean, it's not something that you really do every day. Um, and you're kind of thrown together and you kind of have to build um, this, this thing together and work as a team, even though maybe you haven't even met these people before. So it's really kind of like very intense and kind of, um, you know, hit and miss sometimes. Um, so, our real challenge was this. So our boss, so to speak, President Trump, he didn't really believe in the use of data analytics, um, especially when we started. Um, and so every step of the way, we were tested, we were challenged, we had to really prove our worth. Um, and we started kind of building some donor models, doing some fundraising, um, and then moved to different forms of kind of voter engagement and voter targeting. And, you know, we worked really hard with uh, the RNC as well to build the whole data process uh, from, from zero. And, it, you know, it, um, we kind of, we started working with the campaign at the, um, at the end of June, early July, when he became the actual nominee. So we had a very short period of time to kind of put all, all the things in gear, especially uh, remembering that the other side had been working and had a whole um, team and process in place two years before the campaign. So a little bit of explanation around what Cambridge Analytica does and how then we'll move on to how it played into the campaign. So there's three main core competencies that we kind of combine to be able to kind of work towards engagement. Um, so the first is research and behavioral science. So we undertake thousands and thousands of surveys that really try and pinpoint and gauge what certain motivators are for people, you know, whether you're gonna vote for one person or another, if you, you know, like a product, or not, and you know, it, it really depends on the specific client and the specific question that we want to answer. The second thing is data science, that's where I come in, that's kind of my field of expertise. 
I help build all the predictive models, do all the analysis, uh, run simulations, all of that fun stuff. Um, and then the, th the third thing is really addressable ad technologies. So that's what gives our data science and our research power and reach to be able to speak to people, to be able to kind of communicate and kind of reach the right people with the right message, or at least that's what we really try hard to do. All right, so I mean, we're kind of moving from an age of madmen where com communication is kind of creative led to an age where math men dominate. It's kind of bottom up and it's about what the numbers say the audience would like to hear or are interested in. And this kind of gives us a really like new edge and a new advantage. So this all sounds great, but campaigns, how does this apply to campaigns? You know, how, communication, how does that really work in, in the political sphere? So um, what do you need to know initially? The problem, you know, like any other situation, you need to know what the problem is that you're trying to address. So in the US, to win a US presidential election, I'm gonna teach you all to win a US presidential election now, so I hope that if we have any US citizens, you're ready to candidate yourself at the next one. Um, so how do you win? There's this thing called the Electoral College. So every single state in the US is allocated a number of votes or points or call them whatever you want. And the candidate that wins the majority in that state ends up winning all those points. So it's a numbers game. So of course, I'm more than willing to help out on this. I love numbers. Um, you know, sums are my favorite. And so, you know, there are some, some states in blue on the map. Those are very, very historically democratic states. Like California, no Republican would ever really think of playing in that in that you know state. Otherwise, it's you know you're you're throwing resources for very little gain. And then we have you know classically Republican states like Texas. And you know although you may you know it's shifting and demographic shifts do happen. Really, you want to be playing in the beige states, and they're the swing states. And so those are really the ones that we need to try and play with, that's fine. Um, and to kind of get our equation up to the right number of votes to win. Um, so what process did we come up with? We came up with this process, it kind of has to all feed together. It was really a kind of end-to-end -end solution that we um, integrated. Uh, and it kind of went from, from research, we ran thousands and thousands of polls every single day, every single week from August right until election day. We collected 1,500 um, complete responses per uh, swing state each week. So that's really a much bigger scale of surveying than probably has ever gone on in any campaign, um, at least in the US. Um, and this research fed straight into our models the research allowed us to have kind of a training set, which we combined with our own existing database. Um, and the models then fed into audience segmentations. So who do we need to contact? Who are the voters that you know, we want to communicate with? And that fed straight into advertising and reporting for the campaign so that they keep, could keep track of the progress and what was really going on. So, an interesting question. Where does all this data come from? What is this ba big data that we speak of? Is it even big? I mean, what kind of questions? Well, I mean, I know there's been a lot of news um, around, you know, what data we use and everything else. So I want to dispel any kind of concerns or worries or rumors out there. The data sources we use are based on our own internal research, such as what I, I've already mentioned. They also combine kind of available data vendor data, 
this is just an example of some data vendors out there um, and they uh, kind of collect this data uh, with very strict kind of uh, requirements. And as well, we also combine obviously the voter record and the voter record in the US is publicly available. And we kind of combine all this data um, to, to kind of build our predictive models. So what kind of features are there? Well, there's a whole host of demographic features, kind of very standard age, gender, ethnicity, uh, location. Then there's a whole range of attitudinal data. So, you know, lifestyle features, uh, consumer features, what subscriptions you have, uh, what car you own. Are you interested in a, a certain product or not? And then obviously we combine it with our own research. But anyway, on to the models. Um, so machine learning predictive models are fantastic um, because the algorithms are able to kind of extract the relationships between your data and the target, the thing that you really want to model. Um, and often, I mean, this is just an example of a decision tree um, and it kind of splits all the people based on various attributes at each node um, to try and get the purest prediction. So to split out the two sets. So say Clinton supporters and Trump supporters. And what models did we build during this campaign? We built a whole host of models, starting from fundraising, a donation model, so who to target to try and solicit funds uh, to sort of bring on the, the, the campaign and to get more funds. And that's something that the campaign is really interested in at the beginning. Uh, Trump hadn't done very much uh, donation solicitation up until he was uh, the, ac the nominee, uh, the actual candidate. And so that was a really important step. The other thing that we did, obviously, candidate preference. Which, which side of the spectrum do you sit on? But this is more complicated than just, are you a Democrat or are you a Republican? Because what's particularly interesting is finding those voters who are kind of in the middle and undecided. Other models that we built, sort of likelihood to vote. There's no point in me sending you a message if you're not gonna go and vote, ever, no matter what I say to you. So I'm not gonna spend my resources on you. Then early and absentee votes. Who are the people we need to target first to be able to get the message to them before they go to the polls? Then also, you know, policy issues of interest. This is just so that we can present, you know, the, the candidate's position on an issue that you care about. This is about making the candidate able to talk to each individual about what they're actually interested in. Um, so this is our audience segmentation, um, and it's an example of how we combine models to actually um, message people uh, to create these marketing campaigns. So this is candidate preference on the bottom. You can see the uh, kind of axis that goes from Clinton to Trump uh, preference. So Clinton on the left, your left, yeah, and Trump on the right, um, and turnout likelihood. There's all these people here at the bottom. They're not going to go and vote. There's no point spending money on them. But the people you're interested in are those persuasion people in the middle. Those are the people that you can say, hey, you know, this candidate has a position on the issue that you can relate with. Consider him. Um, then, you know, at the kind of later stage, just before the election is about to happen, in the kind of three weeks, month preceding the actual election date, you want to get out your core support. Um, and the GOTV there, that stands for get out the vote. And those are people that need, an, you know, support your candidate, but they need an extra little bit of persuasion, a little kick to be like, we need you, you need to go and vote because otherwise we're not gonna win this election. And you can message them based on our, you know, the other models. So, you know, get out and vote because, you know, this candidate supports, um, you know, has the same view as you on the economy. 
or immigration. And so it's about presenting, you know, the, the policy issues that are interesting for that person. Um, yeah, I think we're next. All right, so what else did we do apart from these, uh, these kind of models? Well, all of this fed into massive reporting dashboards that were used uh, right from Trump HQ. And um, so the research fed into polling uh, dashboards. And actually, because we were running research every single day, we often saw uh, things happening in the data much sooner than um, they would come up in the public in the public polls. So we were able to feed that to the campaign so that they could come up with a kind of strategy to counteract it or to you know run some rallies. For example, after the first debate, Trump completely you know dipped in the polls. It was a pretty gloomy picture, and um, you know and just having the information a little bit before everyone else really does help. The other thing we also fed were kind of, you can see this heat map up there. That's kind of the supporters that Trump had throughout the US. And we could pinpoint exactly where um, he should travel to, what kind of cities, in what states. Um, and this allowed us to suggest Wisconsin, for example, which had always been quite a, a democratic stronghold. And, uh, Clinton didn't actually travel there once, but Trump traveled there four or five times. And if you think, you know, in the scale of the number of people that, you know, would have attended those rallies, some maybe 50,000 people, um, and that state was won by 50,000 votes. I mean, these are the numbers that really can sway and can make a really, really big difference. Um, also, so here we've got some county. This was some analysis that we ran on different counties on how we thought uh, maybe they would go, whether they were more Republican in 2012 and they were gonna swing one way or another. Um, again, useful for the campaign. Um, and you can see the pie chart. So we'd feed you know, issues given the location. And all of this was kind of calculated and targeted so that we knew the most likely kind of states to win to get to that special electoral college number. The paths to victory were kind of specified. So even if some states seemed, you know, very, very difficult to win at different times, we had to keep fighting in them because it was the only way to, to kind of see, see a way to win. So as I talked about kind of the timeline, you know, fundraising, list building is really important at the beginning, then kind of a lot of event promotion throughout the whole period. Um, the persuasion, which is trying to persuade undecided voters to vote for us versus another candidate. Um, absentee early voting um, and GOTV. And we served 1.4 billion ad impressions through that period. We spent, you know, we placed over $100 million worth of ad buys. This was the first election where the amount spent on digital really overtook traditional media. And the kind of impact was, you know, is measurable. We had an average increase of 3% um, in, in persuasion, in uh, favorability and then also a 2% increase in the submission of absentee ballots for groups that we knew were um, more likely to support us. So these are just some examples of some adverts. You know, here obviously it's a message about childcare. Here's a message about trade and about jobs. Um, and the great thing about digital marketing which I really want to stress to all of you, um, is that it's fantastic for being able to test different uh, creative, different messages, different audiences. Um, and you really get great feedback. There's great analysis tools. Um, and so we ran loads of different uh, lift tests and 
For example, two of them, one was a Facebook brand lift, where we saw a 4% increase between a traditional kind of Democrat to Republican uh, audience versus our modeled audience. So the modeling, the data, it's having an effect. It's identifying people more accurately that are, you know, persuadable towards a candidate. And then the other one was a Google brand lift survey, again, showing a pretty, pretty good result. Um, so really, I want to leave you with two lessons learned from the campaign because it really did teach me a huge amount. Um, so one is really the importance of trusting data over instinct. And this is particularly difficult in the political arena because political experts know everything and you're a data person, you know nothing, you don't understand. You don't understand what those people in Pennsylvania feel. You don't know what they're gonna vote for. Even if you've you know, surveyed them, you've modeled them. Um, so really, and, and there are a few interesting examples um, that, that kind of come to light. So one of the analysis kind of pieces that we did about, I guess a month out, maybe three weeks out from the election, was based on absentee and early votes. So we analyzed who had voted early and absentee com and compared their demographics to 2012. And it was really incredible, the number of rural people who had voted, the 65 plus age bracket, and a reduced number in African American votes. And in some states, the changes in demographic were over 20%. So this suggested to us that scenarios that we needed to consider and think about were vastly, vastly beyond what you know, anyone would think was possible. Um, and I think this is really where the point at which we kind of were like, something might actually you know, change dramatically from what the public polls are saying. There may be a serious you know, hidden Trump vote right there. Um, so I, I think that's a lesson for all of us. Let's vote, sti you know, let's trust the data. Obviously be careful because there are lots of biases um, in data. You have to consider them, but it is often very useful versus insight. And the second one is really about not standing still. And you've probably seen me like march around like a maniac right in front of you. Um, and you can see that I never stand still. But it's more, it's more in a kind of figurative term. It's about always you know, wanting to keep learning and never assuming that because you've done an analysis yesterday, it's gonna hold today. We as people are really unpredictable. Unfortunately, super unpredictable. And so we need to keep refreshing that and keep checking what is the current state of the situation. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for having me, and I hope, I hope you found it interesting.